The War of 1812 ends in 1815, and at least according to the language of the treaties and what the diplomatic historians say, nothing had really been resolved. No borders had changed, no trade policies had been altered to suit the wishes of this country or that country. But in reality, many things would be different in the next few years, because this period that followed, and we can see this in the next four years, for instance, 1815 to 1819, would be a period of the most explosive growth in human economic history up to that point. Industrial capitalism would emerge full-fledged. And people who were living in Britain and the United States would start to realize, just in those few years after the war, that something very significant had changed. The world in which they lived was different from the world in which they had been born. Things were being produced in new ways. They were being transported in new ways. They were being consumed in new ways. Everything seemed to be changing and changing very rapidly. And this is the moment where we can see the curve of growth in the most economically advanced societies in the world really start to take off and rise at unprecedented rates. At last, the West, at any rate, was going to be able to escape out of the gravity well of Malthusian economic dynamics. And the moment we're talking about is the moment where we could really identify something called the Industrial Revolution as opposed to the Industrious Revolution. There were systematic changes in productivity, especially at the heart of the most organized, most advanced economies in the West which will lead to continuous improvements in productivity. In other words, individual laborers are going to be able to produce dramatically more from one hour of labor than had been possible under older systems of production. And this increase in efficiency, an increase which continues and continues to the present day, is what is going to make possible a shift out of the old agricultural systems of production. Now, as we've said before, this improvement, this transformation, really takes off first in northwestern England, uh, around the city of Manchester, which is already, by 1815, the most important site in the world for textile production. And what you see there is clusters of uh, spinning mills and weaving mills that have already emerged by 1815. Now, British policymakers want to keep the power that comes from being that center of industrial production within their own borders, and they especially see the United States as a potential rival now that it has stolen cotton machines. So their policies attempt to, as one, one uh, British lord puts it, strangle the infant United States industry in its cradle. Now, that doesn't work, and in fact, Britain and the U.S. are able to cooperate uh, economically uh, more than to compete with each other over the next few years. Let's talk about how the U.S. plays a role in ensuring that they start to emerge as equal partners in the development of industrial capitalism. But policymakers in the U.S. have other plans. And in fact, by 1815, a pro-development agenda has triumphed in Washington. The old Jeffersonians, who want national expansion to be based primarily on individual small, small farmers who are producing for local markets, they've been pushed off the stage. Now, large-scale commercial agriculture, specifically cotton plantations and the expansion of cotton growing, is going to be tremendously important. That's going to finance American development in some crucial ways. But these pro-development politicians, specifically Kentucky politician Henry Clay, have a very specific agenda, and it's an agenda that's going to shape the growth of the American economy in crucial ways. And there are just uh, three major parts uh, to Clay's agenda, what he calls his American system, that we should mention really quickly. The first is a sound financial system that's going to support national expansion with a steady flow of credit. The second is the creation of a transportation network. Um, an infrastructure for capitalist development, if you will. And thirdly, would be the production or the, the, the protection of American industrial production, infant industries, as they're called. Instead of allowing the British to strangle them 
uh, the infant in industries in the cradle, they're going to be allowed to grow to the point when they can actually compete with British industries on the world stage. So tariff protections for those infant industries will be crucial.